died You said in three days you would rise You did You're alive You rule You reign You said you're coming back again I know But you will And all the earth will sing your praises We'll sing your praises You took, you take our sins away, oh God You gave, you gave your life away for us You came down Because of your great love You lived, you died You said in three days you would rise You did, you're alive You rule, you reign You said you're coming back again I know that you will We'll sing your praises All the earth will sing your praises You took, you take our sins away, oh God You give you gave your life away for us You came down, you saved us through the cross Our hearts are changed because of your great love You lived, you died You said in three days you would rise You did, you're alive Again, I know that you will, and all the earth will sing your praises. All the earth will sing your praises. All the earth will sing your praises. more than 
morning. How are you? How's everybody doing? This morning, I want to read from uh, the Gospel of Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man, this is Jesus speaking, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in person and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of, of, of mine, you did for me. Then I will, then, then he will, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They, they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger, in, or, or, a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in, in prison? And did not help you. He will reply. I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do. For one of the least of these. You did not do for me. Then they will go away. To eternal punishment. But the righteous to eternal life. It's funny because. Jesus is talking about them. The same way. The goats. Or the sheep. And there's only two, two kinds of animals. That are mentioned. But it's, but it's the same thing, except, of course, the sheep are feeding those in need, taking care of those in need. But that's not really what it's about. It's about Christ. It's about believing in Jesus. When we believe in Jesus, see, because of, because of Christ, we are made righteous. Not by what we do, but because of Christ. The goats, they didn't believe. And Jesus. They didn't accept Jesus. They thought they could do things on their own. And Jesus says, no, you can't. Because it's about me. Eternal life is about me. Grace is about me. Love is about me. And that's one thing we need to 
to realize as, as believers. You're either one or the other. You know, I, I ask myself, wait a minute. God, I didn't, that person I saw in the corner, I didn't help him. I could have, but I didn't. I passed him by. But I wonder how many people that don't know Jesus that didn't pass him by. That, that maybe would have helped him. But see, that's where, that's where many people get confused. Is that it's not about what we do or don't do. It's about Christ. It's about trusting in Christ. Trusting in his blood. His saving blood. His, his saving li life and death. Amen? Amen. Father God, we thank you for your son Jesus. We thank you for everything he's done for us, Lord. For his sheep. For his people, God. Help us, Lord, to be um, what you called us to be. Help us to show people... It's not about us. It's not about what we do. Well, we do good, we do good works. Yeah, we do. We're, we're, we're saved to do good works. But it's because of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Trinity Christian Fellowship. God bless rain, although I miss you. My hope is that uh, the rain keeps the fire out of our hills 
and alive in our hearts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God in heaven, holy is your name, and we thank you for being with us, each in our own homes, each in our own way. We're gathering together like we used to, and I pray, Father, that you'd help us to have a good time of, of focusing on your word, experiencing your spirit, helping us to be people who are calm in a time in which there's a lot going on that can rattle us. But Lord, our trust is in you. And Lord, make us a church that's ready to spring into what you have for our future. Lord, help us always to be a people of prayer, praying as Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Turning your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 24, the last story, the ascension. Jesus is leaving and he's taken off. He's been taking about 40 days of uh, a farewell tour. It's been taking him a while to say goodbye. Not there nonstop, but come and go different places. Have you ever known somebody who is kind of always slow at being able to say goodbye, everything's all drawn out. I remember many years ago, I went to go visit somebody's house. And um, I already had an appointment to show up there. Well, there was somebody else visiting them at the time, just as I walked on in, who had been there before. And they said, oh, we better get going. And the wife stood and started to say goodbye to the people. But the husband stayed seated. And he said, it'll take her 20 minutes to say goodbye. I'm not standing up before I absolutely have to. Sometimes people string out their goodbyes. Matter of fact, not far from here, we have a store that's been having their going out of business sale for over a year now. It um, takes some time sometimes. Sometimes you see people that are athletes and they just can't let go of their athletic years and they hobble up and down the court or out in the field and you kind of think, give it up, dude, the time is over. Well, Jesus took deliberative time in saying goodbye. And especially in this section, he is letting us know what is important to hold on to because he's going to be gone. And we've got to catch up on some things. Let me read the passage, starting with verse 44. It says this, Jesus said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. The first of three things he's really anchoring them in is the written, the, the written word. He has a written direction for him. When I'm going off to the store, going to the, the Home Depot or wherever it is, a long list of appointments, I write it out because I do not trust my brain to hold on to everything. Writing is pretty important. And he talks about in verse 44, specifically those things which are in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Obviously, he's talking about the Old Testament and all the ways in which he fulfilled them. Now we get to verse 46 and we have a little bit of a different scenario there. He uses the phrase, this is what is written, and then he goes on to say a couple of lines. The thing is, is that passage is not in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, uh, many commentators say this is really a summary of a lot of places. Now the resurrection is in places like Psalm 16. Jesus' sufferings, that's in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, and so on. But there's certain segments that he said in that passage that just simply are not in the Old Testament. 
plainly out. And in the Gospel of Luke, he uses that phrase, it is written 17 times, and just about always is referring to an actual verse of Scripture that is being quoted, or if not quoted, then really specifically summarized. And so when we're looking at this, I see an opportunity. Now, most say it's just a summary of Old Testament Scripture across the board, and that could very well be. But in some respects, I see Jesus giving a hint to the disciples that there isn't just the Old Testament writings that they're going to be dealing with. There is going to be New Testament writings in the works. Matter of fact, if you just wait for a little bit over a week from this day of ascension, Peter is going to get on up and he's going to give a great sermon in Acts chapter 2. And that sermon can very easily be summarized by the verse that he just said. And there's other places, for instance, in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, which has not been written yet, uh, that sounds very much like this passage. And there's other places, for instance, in Acts chapter 26, in which Peter is preach, excuse me, Paul is preaching a, uh, a message, and he says in verse 23 that the Messiah would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead and would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. This passage actually anchors a little bit better to some verses that would be in the New Testament, not the Old Testament. But that's just my pet theory as far as that goes. But the main thing that's being talked about here is the Anchor yourself to what is written. Jesus is going to be gone. Don't just trust your memory or your hunches. Anchor into the written. Now, we're going to be covering a lot more of this next week when we start our new series on winging it in chapter 1 of the book of Acts. Just the importance of that which is written. Well, let's go to the second thing that he tells them to anchor into, and that is purpose, verse 48 and 49. A purpose for living, that is, to be witnesses for the Lord. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, where Luke records this a little bit more in detail, he describes it this way, but you will receive power from the Holy, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He's telling the disciples, start where you're at, Jerusalem. And then from there, this is actually a very good geographic outline of the whole book of Acts. You start in Jerusalem, you leapfrog to Judea, the area around that, from there to Samaria, from there to the other most parts of the world. Start where you're at. You don't have to have big goals elsewhere. Start where you're put. But then there's another thing in this about witnessing. What does a witness do? A witness tells what they saw and heard and experienced. That's what a witness does. You don't have to make up anything. It's best if you don't. And that's what Jesus calls the disciples to do. What you saw, what you heard, what you experienced. In many respects, when the Lord calls us to be witnesses, he's not asking us to become experts in apologetics or polemics or archaeology, or psychology, or a million other things. He wants us to be able to tell what Jesus did for us. Saving our souls, changing our lives, answering prayer, giving us healing, giving us peace of mind, changing us from rags to riches spiritually. That's what we share. We can start with what we have. Here's the thing. I remember when I was back in college, I was pretty sure that I did not have any testimony worth listening to. In the college where I was at, I had so many friends who had been before drug addicts. They had been gang members. They had been people that uh, were atheists. And they came to Jesus and they just made a huge splash for God. People loved hearing their testimonies. What did I have? I think I got a few certificates on perfect attendance in Sunday school when I was a kid, but that was basically the extent of any frills that came from a do-gooder guy. And I thought I pretty much had nothing to say. Well, there came a time in which I was traveling with one of the professors from our college. He had an uh, appointment to be speaking at a church on a Sunday night, far from the school. He was going to be driving kind of well late into the night, and I was basically ballast for the car or basically to keep him awake as he was driving through the night. 
Those of you who are listening to my sermon might say, hey, Al, they thought you could keep people awake? Well, who would have known? But anyway, when he was talking to me, I brought up this whole thing about testimony because he had a fantastic testimony too. He was a man who did not believe in God, was going to the university, lived the life of all the strange things that college people can get into, and God met him and changed his life. It was incredible. And I thought, I wish I could have a testimony that was like that. And he said, oh, no, 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 you don't. He says, people like me have big stories to tell. Most of the time, we wish we could scrub and scour those memories from our brain. But what does encourage us is when we see that the words of Jesus about following his word, just walking the walk as well as talking the talk, and simply going about letting the Holy Spirit in your own failing way direct your steps is incredibly exciting. Lord can use all of our testimonies. He does not ask us to be something other than we are as far as witnesses. Start where you're at with who you are. And that is his calling. You know what he's going to put with that? He says he will clothe you with the Holy Spirit, with power. That verb for clothing is important. It underscores purpose. Clothing tells a lot about a person. For instance, like whether their appearance matters. Sometimes it tells whether they have a lot of money or little whether they're working at the time or not, whether they're in the military, whether they're going to paint a barn or they're going to go to a wedding. You can tell a lot by a person's clothing. And so when we have a purpose on letting the Lord's story shine through us, it's pretty clear what we're about. And with that, we are endowed with power. We just share the simple story, and we let the power of the Lord take it from there. When I was back in seminary in the county where we we were at, there were a few snake handling churches in the county. And in their services, I am told, you don't just walk on over and pick up the snake. Now, you got to get in the zone first. And normally that means there's some fiddle players somewhere in the building that is really amping things up and people are getting themselves into a frame of mind, frenzy, whatever it is, before you actually just pick up the snake. I guess that's okay for them to do. They, I'll pass on all that. We're over in Turkey. We're learning a lot about the twirling dervishes and how by spinning you get yourself into a trance that is somehow helpful. Again, I'll leave that to them. The thing is, in the early church and in Scripture, the church didn't wait to get into a certain trance or into a certain zone or to get psyched up. Share what God has done for you. He anoints the power of the Holy Spirit on it, and that's where it takes place. Well, the third thing that we are told to, um, oh, one more verse on that, sorry. I love this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. Our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power and with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You have to have a little bit of conviction and, and boldness in it. Don't share your testimony just like it's a deposition, reading it dryly. As for the Holy Spirit's power on you. The last thing, a triumphal exit. Triumphal exit. You heard of the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday? This is the opposite. You see, on Palm Sunday, Jesus started in Bethany, came over the hill of, of, of the Mount of Olives, and then in Jerusalem. Here, he's going the opposite direction on the same road. He starts in Jerusalem, up over the hill, going towards Bethany. I call it the triumphal exit. We had a Palm Sunday before. In this one, it's a Thursday. So we had a Palm Thursday. Maybe not Palm Branches, but he says he does raise his hand to bless them. And so I guess that'll suffice as a Palm as far as we're concerned. But uh, in this passage, it's described a little bit better in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, where it says this. He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who, was, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Now, what a fantastic experience that would have been. Now, we call that a triumphal exit can you imagine what it was like for Jesus entering heaven? 
to be able to see his father face to face. The angels around, the saints around up there. It must have been awesome. A football team charging onto the football field, breaking through the little paper sign they have for him. What an awesome experience that would have been for him. It's triumphant on that side. But I don't know about you, but when somebody I love from down here leaves, I'm not exactly joyful. I'm usually borderline depressed. And uh, the church wasn't, though. They had joy. Now, Jesus is going up there for a good purpose for us. We're told in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 34, he's going to intercede for us. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And I guess that gives us all a lot to be joyful and happy about. Here's the thing. Jesus says goodbye, and in verse 52, it says they have great joy. Wow. Verse 53 says they go to the temple courts, and they start praising there. Can you imagine them going to the temple courts? These are the same guys who back on Easter and one week after Easter were scared in the upper room with the doors locked because they were scared of the people who ran the temple, who had just whacked Jesus, and now they're going to roll right in there and have a ball. They are too joyful to care about the threat. It's just not registering with them. They have a lot of joy. Matter of fact, it continues for some time. In the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47, it says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. <laughs> they enjoyed being right there in the lion's mouth, the temple, and they had a ball doing it. A lot of joy. Well, Luke ends his story there in the temple courts. But if you were to go back to the very first chapter of the book of Luke, Luke begins his story in the temple courts with one old, frail, scared man, Zechariah. He's told he's going to have a son named John the Baptist. He starts there with one scared old man, ends with a big group of people enjoying life triumphantly in the t uh, temple courts. You know, a lot of us might think, I don't know that I can be brave like that. I don't know that I can be bold and confident like that. Understood. Understood. Maybe as an alternative, instead of being brave or confident or bold, can you be joyful? Joyful, just like these guys. Joyful for the blessings God has given you, for the things that you're very thankful for. The thing is, I don't know there's a whole lot of difference, effectively, between being joyful and bold and confident and brave. Let's pray. Great God in heaven, help us to walk the walk, to talk the talk, to be joyful people sharing what Jesus has done for us. Direct our paths in this, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now let's say the benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.